The Battle of Thermopylae between the Persians and an alliance of Greek city-states was documented by the Greek historian Herodotus. Recently, it's been reinterpreted in a graphic novel by Frank Miller. Would never to retreat, never to surrender. Film director Zack Snyder has brought much of Miller's graphic novel to life in the film 300. Snyder used blue and green screen technology and some very basic techniques to create the effects. Blue and green screen technology are techniques where filming takes place against a coloured background, which is later replaced with a computer-generated image or scene. Most of the movie's backgrounds were computer-generated. Snyder says while the technique is not revolutionary, they did use it in new and different ways. In one of history's most famous last stands, the Spartans, led by King Leonidas, held back the Persian army for three days. Snyder explains that some of the special effects were created in surprisingly simple ways. He says he thinks some of the technology was particularly suited for use in 300, but is possibly not right for every film. The next generation of film animators is being trained here at the media school attached to Bournemouth University in southern England. The National Centre for Computer Animation attracts students from around the world. It offers master's courses in computer science and computer art to experienced graphic artists. Entrance to the National Centre for Computer Animation is not easy. Prospective students have to demonstrate considerable talent. The school takes mature artists and designers and teaches them the technical skills they need to apply their talent to the new media. This animation, beloved by Alex Wilkie, is typical of the standard achieved by recent graduates. The success rate of the students in finding work is very high. Films such as the Lord of the Rings trilogy were made with the help of Bournemouth graduates. Moscow's Souvenir was created by Luke Bailey. It's another example of the range of styles achievable with the same basic animation software and imagination. Animation is a problem-solving discipline. Each new project and even each new shot present unique problems. Artists need a broad range of skills and a flexible approach. From two-dimensional concept sketches, a three-dimensional wire frame is developed where the basic movements can be induced. Theros was made by 2005 graduate Georgios Cherovim. Animation for film and TV is not the only career path open to graduates. The computer game industry is huge and it needs skilled artists. Animation used to require thousands of hand-drawn cells to make even a short cartoon. Now the use of powerful digital techniques has eliminated this time-consuming process. As the industry expands, demand for these graduates is growing. Un Amor Mobile by Ian McKinnon is a boy meets girl story that takes place within the confines of a hanging paper mobile. An old tale with a charming, old-fashioned, hand-drawn look. At Bournemouth, very old techniques are being transformed into cutting-edge skills. Body mass index is a ratio between a person's height and their weight and for decades, it has served as a guide in assessing levels of obesity. Now a scanning technique is showing exactly where a person's fat deposits are, and it's giving a far more accurate picture of an individual's fat distribution. 
Hammersmith Hospital in northwest London is using magnetic resonance imaging to analyze the way fat is stored inside our bodies. The most basic scan takes about four minutes. Radiographer Julie Fitzpatrick takes picture slices of the person's body. This image shows the amount of fatty deposits around the heart and other organs. Up to 40% of the British population may have hidden fat around their organs, which has implications for heart disease and diabetes. Meanwhile in Germany, medical scanning is being used in a radically different way. At the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences, volunteers slide into an MRI machine. Their brains will be scanned as they are asked to perform simple mental tasks, such as deciding whether to add or subtract two numbers, or choosing which of two buttons to press. Scientists are trying to figure out their subjects' intentions before they are turned into action. The research tries to optimize the technique to determine how many different thoughts can be read. In the recent study, participants were told to decide whether to add or subtract two numbers a few seconds before the numbers were flashed on a screen. Areas of brain activity were recorded to determine the subject's decision, with one pattern suggesting addition and another subtraction. The team began its research by trying to identify which part of the mind was storing intentions. By scanning the brain when subjects were given choices, they discovered activity in the prefrontal cortex region. The research, which began in July 2005, has been of limited scope. Only 21 people have been tested so far, and the 71% accuracy rate is only around 20% more successful than random selection. While still in its initial stages, the techniques could eventually have wide-ranging implications for things like criminal interrogations or airline security checks. This has alarmed ethicists who fear the technology could one day be abused. For the moment, reading minds is a cumbersome process and there is no chance scientists could covertly spy on an individual's decision-making. The study focuses on people who choose between just two simple alternatives. Now, a far simpler form of body scan that uses lights and cameras instead of MRI. It's being used as part of a British project called the Body Benchmark Study. The system hardware consists of a small booth lined with specially aligned lights and 32 cameras. X-rays or heavy magnetic fields are not involved in the scanning procedure. In around six seconds, a three-dimensional image is compiled, designed to give a more accurate idea of where a person's fat deposits are stored. The information derived from this new scanning technique has given rise to a new yardstick known as the Body Volume Index. It is designed to give people an accurate idea of their body composition. The more conventional Body Mass Index is flawed as it doesn't differentiate between people of different shapes. Where people store fat is just as important as how much fat they carry. People who carry excess weight around their stomachs are at higher risk of heart disease. The World Health Organization says 150 million people will be officially obese by 2010, exacerbating a range of healthcare problems. The plan now is to scan at least 20,000 people over the next two years to give a more accurate idea of people's shapes. Coming into land at New York's JFK International Airport, the A380 Airbus after its first transatlantic flight. On board were more than 500 passengers and crew. At around the same time on the other side of the United States, another A380 was landing at Los Angeles International Airport. Although the aircraft is huge, its makers say it's a more environmentally friendly machine than its nearest rivals and is quieter as well. On touchdown at both airports, tests were arranged to see how the double-decker would handle at the terminal. 
Most of the passengers on Lufthansa Flight 8940 from Frankfurt were Airbus and Lufthansa employees, along with some reporters. The aircraft was unveiled in Toulouse in France in January 2005. It's a joint venture between the European Aeronautic Defence and Space Company and the UK's BAE Systems. The plane has secured 166 orders and the trip to the United States was designed to lift the aircraft's American profile in the hope that US airlines will order the giant plane. The Lufthansa A380 has room for 549 passengers in first, business and economy class, with 23 cabin crew and five flight crew. The A380 is 50% bigger than the Boeing 747. In some configurations, it has shops, bars and even private cabins. First class is luxury of the highest order with some models even having their own nursery for children. Officials were keen to see if docking at gates and passenger disembarkation could run smoothly, and if support infrastructure such as refueling facilities could perform promptly. The eight hour flight to New York from Frankfurt was a chance to show off the A380 to potential American buyers and to the airports they hope to turn into flight bases for the jet. Airbus says regular long-distance flyers will appreciate the comfortable and spacious interior layout. The 73-metre-long A380 can burn 4 litres of fuel per passenger every 140 kilometres and fly more than 14,000 kilometres without refuelling. Three full decks run along the entire length of the plane. Upper and main decks will serve as passenger areas and are connected by a grand staircase near the front of the plane and by another smaller staircase at the back. The lower deck is reserved primarily for cargo, but in some configurations, it could be outfitted for special passenger uses, such as sleeper cabins, business centers, or even childcare service. In a one-class configuration, the A380 could accommodate as many as 840 passengers the more likely three-class configuration offers an unprecedented 549 passenger seats. In-flight entertainment and communication systems have been upgraded in the new aircraft. Emirates Airlines has ordered 45 A380s and wants its models to have an extra range of high-tech passenger options. Airbus hopes the A380, designed to carry more people further than any plane in history, will dominate air travel for the next two decades. The other A380 that landed in Los Angeles for its West Coast debut was operated by Australian airline Qantas. That plane also performed tests at the California airport, including airfield maneuvers, docking at the terminal gate and ground and gate handling exercises. The recent US flights were designed to prove that the plane will be ready when the first deliveries are made in October 2007 to Singapore Airlines. The Rio de Janeiro Botanical Gardens were created by the Prince Regent of Portugal in 1808. They were originally used to cultivate plant species brought from other continents and still preserve a European flavor. More recently, the garden has become a major research institution dedicated to the study of the most threatened of Brazilian ecosystems, the Atlantic rainforest. A large stretch of rainforest borders the gardens. Charles Kokajimskis, the garden's operations director, says botanists working at the gardens are trying to identify the main species present in the forest and catalogue them for the public. Researchers work in the herbarium and in the laboratories attached to the gardens. The collection is gradually being scanned and entered into a database 
which will in the future be accessible to the public online. More than 300,000 specimens will be available once the work is completed. The latest addition to the research facilities here is a scanning electron microscope, an instrument capable of amplifying images one million times. A group of graduate students at the Botanical Gardens are learning to operate the instrument to study plants from the Atlantic rainforest. The microscope allows botanists to see different aspects of the plant, thus identifying them more easily. Plant samples are coated with gold, so they will conduct electricity before being placed in a vacuum chamber inside the microscope. The bromeliads attract particular attention because of the part they play in forest and garden ecosystems. The biologist in charge of the bromeliads, Eron Zanelato, says they provide habitats for frogs. Many animal and plant species in Brazil's Atlantic rainforest are endangered, and Rio's botanical gardens are dedicated to preserving the country's biodiversity. The melting of the world's glaciers is a strong indicator of climate change, and glaciologists in France have been watching in alarm as their glaciers recede. At the Laboratory of Glaciology and Environmental Geophysics in Grenoble, five French glaciers are being observed, and they give a very clear indication of climate change. A recent report from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development has warned that warming temperatures are threatening Europe's lucrative ski trade. Around the world, glaciers are in decline. Scientists in Greenland report dwindling glaciers and satellites are observing the thinning of ice at both the poles. This will have a significant effect on economies that depend on winter sports. Artificial snowmaking has been essential this year across the Alps, but when temperatures rise above a certain threshold, this is not always a viable option. At ski resort Les Deux Alpes, Gilles Van Herl, the director of the tourist office, says that artificial snow is becoming essential for skiing, but cannot always be relied on. Environment ministers meeting in Germany ahead of the G8 summit are scheduled to speak on issues surrounding global warming, including binding targets for reductions in CO2 emissions and commitments to climate change technology. Glaciologist Christian Vincent estimates that if average temperatures continue to rise at the present rate, the world will see a three degree increase by 2100. At this rate of warming, glaciers below 3,400 meters will disappear in several decades time. This last mild winter has spelled disaster for many ski fields. Ultra-fast high-powered video games are only possible because of one of the most modern chip factories in the world. The chips inside the games, called power chips and cell chips, come from 300 millimeter silicon wafers that are imprinted with a delicate network of nanometer thin circuitry. The plant that makes them is so modern that most of the workers are not even human. They are robot pods called FOOPs or front opening unified pods. The wafers go through hundreds of production steps as they are wired, polished, engraved and checked for errors. They are constantly developing newer, thinner, tinier chips and other new technologies. 900 kilometers of wiring connect operations computers and the FOOPs. And while the computers control the FOOPs, the 2,000 people who keep the factory open around the clock are ultimately in charge. They check each wafer for irregularities. In 2000, IBM invested heavily in new manufacturing technology and production took off when Microsoft and Nintendo committed to taking the power chips for their consoles. 
Dual development deals with Sony and Toshiba produce the cell chips, which have nine processing engines in a space tinier than the smallest coin. The cell chip is only 65 nanometers thick, and it has hundreds of millions of transistors. Around 250 engineers and managers from partner companies work at the IBM factory. Once the process is complete, the chips are separated and used in Xboxes, Playstations and servers. And that's what makes the golf ball fly and the virtual soldiers hit their targets. The Iran Ryanair Engineering Company showcased its Philopro document management system at the IT Fair CBIT in Germany recently. Amir Masood Osquila, the managing director of the company, says he hopes the system will gain international exposure. The Philopro package is a document management system which enables users to store and manage text and image documents. The company also offers computer training, network administration, network maintenance and troubleshooting services. The Iran Rayane Engineering Company participated at CBIT as part of a group of 15 companies known as the Sanare Consortium. CBIT showcases digital, IT and telecommunications products to industry professionals and interested enthusiasts. It's the world's largest IT-related trade event and it attracts thousands of exhibitors from some 70 countries. The annual CBIT Fair opened with dancing and a light show. Mobile phone technology was one of the star attractions at this year's show. Electronics company Celity unveiled an intelligence software for mobile phones that can be downloaded as simply as a ringtone. It compares their own pay scale with other inexpensive connections. If there is a cheaper connection, it will be directly chosen by Celity automatically. Insiders say the most important new development are the fast networks being rolled out by the telecommunications suppliers. They offer everything via just one internet connection. You can telephone, watch television, and have access to the internet all via one stable portal. This year, Russia is CBIT's partner country. It has the fourth largest range of exhibits at the fair. More than 150 Russian exhibitors were presenting their innovations, including leading companies such as Kaspersky Lab, Incotex, and Rusoft.